So just before we kick off the session, uh, just would like to quick raise of hands. How many of you are currently using Spark operator on Kubernetes today? That's not a bad number. That's good. But we're going to cover a bit of basics of the Spark and then Spark operator. Uh, so I think you should be OK. Right, so with that, my name is Vara Buntu. I'm a principal open source specialist SA working with AWS. And I'm also a Qflow Spark operator maintainer. And in my day-to-day -day job, I work with uh, data and ML platforms and building these platforms highly scalable on Kubernetes. Yeah, uh, that's me. With me, uh, uh, my co-presenter, uh, Sharon, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, to, uh, thanks for attending our talk. Uh, my name is Charan. I lead the uh, solutions engineering team at Apple. I'm one of the uh, early contributors of the Spark Operator project and also a uh, maintainer. Glad to be here today. Thanks, Sharon. Right, um, so this is elevating Qflow Spark Operator. So we're going to talk about some of the best, pra pra best practices and enhancements in today's session. So with that, um, we're going to touch upon some of the basics of uh, Apache Spark and how, how Spark Operator has evolved. And we will also talk about the migration of Spark Operator from Google to Qflow community, which is Qflow org. And since we migrated to Qflow Spark Operator, we added a lot of enhancements and features. Then we'll touch upon all the enhancements and features. And we will discuss some of the best practices of running Spark Operator on Kubernetes in any platform. And finally, uh, we discuss some of the Qflow community, how you can join and become part of the community to work with the Spark Operator. Right. So. Before I give a, an introduction to Spark Operator, I want to touch upon uh, Apache Spark itself, right? So most of you are familiar with Apache Spark. Apache Spark is a very popular and distributed data processing framework, which is used for both batch processing, streaming, and even machine learning workloads today, right? In Apache Spark in 2018, uh, in version 2.3, that is when Apache Spark added a support for running on Kubernetes uh, in addition to um, Hadoop and you know, Mesos. So that's when things have changed. A lot of customers and organizations started to run the Spark on Kubernetes. So within the same year in 2018, uh, the same contributors also started building the Spark operator. And they built, and some of the Google folks have built the Google Cloud. I think they are from Google Cloud Platform. And they built this Google Spark operator, and they open sourced in 2018. But since then, that's been used by a lot of organizations. As you see, I think 40 companies as per the adopters page. And there's a lot of starts in the repo. And, and most importantly, Spark operator, it actually simplifies the, the, the life cycle of the Spark job execution on Kubernetes itself. Right? It manages the automation of the Spark job uh, and ensures the life cycle of it and retries when the Spark job fails. And it has all the capabilities in terms of the metrics. Uh, and, and in overall, uh, it simplifies the journey of the Spark running on Kubernetes. Right, so let me touch about a bit about how Spark operator um, the migrated to Qflow, right? So in, I think in last year and in KubeCon, uh, myself and Sharon from Apple and Martin from Google and a few other folks got together. Um, and we talked about, you know, Google Spark Operator has been there, a lot of customers are using, but it was suffering from some of the maintenance issues from the last two to three years. Um, we spoke to some of those maintainers from Google and discussed about, you know, the options, and they were ready to donate that project to, you know, the bigger communities like Apache as well as Qflow. So we submitted that SPIP proposal to both Apache's, Apache as well as Qflow. Uh, unfortunately, it was not accepted under Apache, but it was accepted by the Qflow community. So that was an issue, what you're seeing. Um, and with that, and I think few months of the work, uh, we managed to migrate that the repo from Google Cloud Platform 
to Qflow community. And so we announced a blog, and blog has uh, pretty much all the details and with the QR code, if you look at it. But um, with the people like Sharon, Andre, and a lot of other people came, to, came along and tried to migrate the whole repo and, and build a community around it. So with that, uh, I would like to touch upon what you see on the slide is a simple Spark operator manifest. Like, if you want to run Spark job on Kubernetes, so with Spark submit, you might have to create uh, the large JSON file with all the configurations. But with Spark operator, you'll be writing a simple YAML file. You just define the kind as a Spark application and the driver spec and executor spec. That's the minimum spec that you need to run the job. Just run kubectl apply that goes to Kubernetes API and creates all the driver and executor parts and runs the job. And it manages the lifecycle by the Spark operator itself. But then moving on to uh, some of the internals of the Spark operator, right? So we talked about, okay, so what does Spark operator does? Internally, there are four components within the Spark operator, as you see there. One of them is a controller, which is like heart of the Spark operator. So when user, the manifest that we have seen from the previous slide, submits using kubectl apply, and that manifest will be submitted to the API server, Kubernetes API server. That is when the Spark operator controller comes into the picture and start watching for this Spark application custom resources. And when, when it finds one, and then it validates the spec and identifies if the spec is valid. And once it validates, it sends back to the second component of the Spark operator, which is a submission runner. And submission runner, runner is like a crucial component. What it does is converts that Spark application into a Spark submit command, which is a native way of sub submitting Spark jobs to Kubernetes. Once a job is submitted, and then you have Spark pod monitor, which is another component it keeps watching for the status of the driver and executors and reporting back to the controller on the latest status. And finally, the, uh, the fourth component is a mutating admission webhook. This is uh, it's crucial until this point, but we're going to talk about the feature, which is spot templates. That comes in later. But mutating ad admission webhook runs along with the Spark operator. This ensures that all your volumes are attached and ready before the Spark job is started. So it takes care of a lot of other things, like adding labels, node selectors, stains, and config max creations, and so on. So that's pretty much all the key components of the Spark operator internals. But in summary, uh, you know, when you submit a Spark job, and Spark operator takes care of the whole life cycle, and it provides a feature such as retrying when something fails, and it also provides some metrics that we will discuss in the later slides. So, with that, I'll hand over to Sharon, who's going to talk about new features and enhancements that we added to Spark Operator since we migrated to Qflow. Thank you. All right, thanks, Laura. Uh, I'll be going over uh, some of the highlights, uh, uh, some recent contributions from the community, uh, major uh, features and enhancements uh, that the community did ever since the uh, migration of the project to Qflow. Uh, to start off, uh, I'll be covering the documentation website and the container registry migration to Qflow. Uh, then uh, I'll spend a few minutes on, the, uh, on a major rewrite of the project using a framework called uh, Controller Runtime. And, and after that, uh, let's also talk about uh, two primary ways of uh, customizing the behaviors of uh, Spark applications. Uh, the first way is to, to use uh, what's called pod template, which is a feature uh, that's uh, made available uh, in Apache Spark itself since uh, Spark 3.0 uh, that allows uh, users to uh, customize uh, uh, properties and fields of uh, Spark pods. And another way is to uh, uh, infuse some batch uh, scheduling capabilities using a, another open source project called Apache Unicorn. And after that, uh, let's uh, go over uh, best practices in the areas of uh, security, uh, multi-tenancy, uh, metrics, and monitoring. So first off, uh, some logistics. And uh, since the project uh, is uh, now under Kubeflow, we migrated the uh, container registry uh, from the, uh, their original home of uh, Google Container Registry, or GCR, to Kubeflow. Uh, and in the past, uh, Docker images for Spark Operator uh, live under uh, GCR, and the project maintainer had to uh, manually generate those images and uh, push those uh, to GCR. And now uh, new images uh, completely um, uh, live under Kubeflow, Docker Hub uh, uh, organization, and images are automatically generated and pushed uh, using an automated pipeline upon each uh, operator release. 
And uh, we've also included a, a screenshot of the, uh, uh, the new operator documentation website. You can see that uh, it's uh, now hosted under uh, Kubeflow official uh, website and uh, sitting alongside other Kubeflow components like model registry, uh, Kubeflow pipelines, and so on. Uh, next, let's talk about uh, this uh, major refactoring of uh, operator uh, using uh, controller runtime. And this is a uh, major uh, refactoring, uh, or I would say a complete rewrite. Uh, and uh, I've provided a link to the uh, PR uh, if you are interested in uh, reviewing the code in more detail. But before talking about this uh, refactoring itself, uh, some uh, historical background. Uh, originally, when the operator was uh, first created uh, years ago, uh, the uh, original implementation was uh, uh, created based on uh, client Go, which is uh, still to this day the uh, official uh, Golang SDK for Kubernetes. This is a powerful piece of software. Uh, it allows uh, de a developer to uh, do basically anything uh, that's possible within a Kubernetes uh, environment. Uh, it's, it's a great tool, but uh, when it comes to writing a custom controller for an operator, it's not very convenient because uh, lots of the operations that are uh, essential uh, for, uh, for an operator need to be manually handled. And among those operations uh, include uh, CRUD operations on CRD objects. Uh, in our case, this is uh, operations on uh, Spark applications, CRD objects and also uh, management of uh, uh, informers, uh, work queues, and uh, listers. And uh, in case you are not familiar, uh, these are critical mechanisms uh, in any operator implementation. An informer is a, uh, is a uh, mechanism that allows an operator uh, to be informed of any changes and actions uh, uh, that are happening to the uh, CRD uh, objects that are of interest, and so that the operator can uh, uh, take actions accordingly based on the custom logic that the developer has uh, implemented. And a work queue uh, is also uh, essential. Uh, as the name suggests, it's a, a queue uh, that uh, hosts, uh, that includes, uh, uh, that, that basically queues up all the events that are happening to the CRD objects in the cluster. And the uh, operator will be uh, uh, basically doing dequeuing operation on the work queue uh, and processes uh, those uh, uh, items in the, uh, in the queue in an orderly fashion. And the listers allows an operator to uh, list um, uh, all the objects in the Kubernetes cluster and also allows for uh, support of um, uh, uh, custom labels and uh, annotations and so on, or filtering by namespaces. And that's uh, straightforward. Uh, so uh, a good thing about controller runtime is that it offers a higher level abstraction compared to client Go, so that developers don't have to uh, spend time uh, writing those um, uh, basic primitives. And uh, all of these features that I talked about uh, just now uh, are provided by controller runtime out of the box. And what's even better is that there's another open source project called KubeBuilder, uh, which is uh, uh, hosted under Kubernetes uh, special interest groups, uh, GitHub org. And uh, KubeBuilder provides uh, a, a, a more convenient way of uh, using controller runtime. It provides a lot of uh, code generation and scaffolding capabilities so that a developer can quickly uh, get up to speed running uh, and writing a, a new operator. And what this PR uh, uh, did was uh, to use uh, KubeBuilder to generate uh, the new project structure and uh, porting over the existing uh, logic uh, for handling Spark applications to the uh, new project structure. And uh, this is a uh, major highlight of the uh, recent release, uh, major release that the, the community uh, did uh, for uh, version 2.0. Uh, and uh, the author uh, came from Alibaba, and uh, this author is now also uh, admitted as one of the uh, maintainers of the uh, project. Uh, next up, let's uh, talk about uh, a uh, feature that's uh, available in Apache Spark itself called uh, Pod Template. And, uh, also, uh, just like previously, before talking about the feature itself, some uh, background. And since the uh, in initial creation of the operator project, uh, it relied heavily on uh, what's called a webhook uh, for customizing Spark pods. And these customization uh, operations are um, uh, commonplace, and uh, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, commonly needed for many uh, use cases. And those include adding uh, volumes, uh, mounting volumes, uh, config maps, uh, init containers, uh, and so on. And uh, Webhook was, a, uh, was an effective uh, mechanism uh, for handling uh, these responsibilities. Uh, but uh, it proves to be uh, quite uh, tricky uh, to automate and uh, maintain, uh, especially in a production environment. Uh, because a, a Webhook, this Webhook uh, that the operator uh, is uh, embedded with uh, is, a, is an HTTP service. And uh, uh, because of that, it needs a, uh, a dedicated uh, Kubernetes secret, which needs to be generated with a one-time Kubernetes job uh, upon the initial deployment of the operator. And also, uh, it needs to be refreshed upon at, uh, each re redeployment of the operator. 
and, uh, and also that one-time Kubernetes job needs to be uh, cleaned up upon completion. Uh, so all of these um, um, uh, details uh, require some uh, special handling and automation. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's some extra work, uh, especially in production. And ever since uh, Spark 3.0 added the uh, pod template support, uh, it's, uh, uh, it has uh, become the uh, uh, standard way of uh, uh, customizing Spark pods, uh, basically taking over all the responsibilities that uh, the operator webhook uh, has been uh, responsible for uh, in the past. Uh, and pod template provides a uh, much uh, lighter weight option uh, while um, uh, avoiding all the hassles of uh, uh, maintenance and the operations uh, that, uh, that were uh, present with the uh, uh, webhook. And uh, another highlight in uh, version 2.0 uh, is uh, the added support for Apache Unicorn. Uh, in case you are not familiar, Apache Unicorn is uh, another open source project that provides a, a, a special uh, scheduling capabilities uh, that's geared toward batch-oriented workloads. Uh, batch workloads differ from uh, online uh, or uh, long-running uh, web services uh, type of workloads in a number of uh, significant ways. Uh, for example, many of them have requirements for uh, uh, quota enforcement or uh, application ordering uh, or GAN scheduling. And uh, a good thing about Apache Unicorn is that uh, it doesn't require much uh, extra work to be integrated with uh, any, uh, uh, any framework. Uh, and Spark Operator was already working well with the Apache Unicorn uh, to take advantage of its uh, capabilities for handling uh, queues, uh, resource quotas, uh, and application ordering. Uh, and, uh, uh, but the significance of this uh, recent contribution uh, is uh, to add the support for GAN scheduling. And a few words about GAN scheduling. Uh, it's a common requirement for batch workloads, especially for machine learning workloads, uh, because uh, those type of workloads require that uh, a certain uh, group of uh, workers uh, to be scheduled, uh, to be considered uh, as a single unit uh, during scheduling time. And uh, scheduling should only happen for this uh, GAN of uh, uh, workers uh, if the resources in the cluster can be, um, uh, there are sufficient resources in the environment to meet, uh, the, uh, to meet the requirements for the entire GAN, as opposed to one single uh, worker within that uh, uh, GAN. And uh, Apache Unicorn has a, a unique way of uh, uh, implementing GAN scheduling. The way it does it is uh, uh, through this mechanism called uh, placeholder pods. So what that does is that Unicorn uses uh, uh, some fake pods that we call placeholder pods to reserve uh, resources for uh, real pods uh, before the real pods are uh, generated uh, uh, in the first place. And those pla placeholder pods will be uh, reserving resources and uh, try to test the waters to see whether the environment has uh, sufficient resources to meet the uh, GAN requirements. And uh, a key uh, requirement uh, in this uh, uh, GAN scheduling uh, implementation for Unicorn uh, is that uh, the placeholder pods need to be of identical resource request compared to the real pods that will be replacing those uh, uh, real, uh, fake, fake pods um, uh, in the future. Uh, and if the resource request between the uh, placeholder pods and the real pods, if there's any discrepancy between them, there can be subtle bugs that uh, may occur. Uh, so there, there has to be an exact match. Uh, this PR basically added the uh, calculation logic for uh, placeholder pod uh, resource request. And for Apache Spark, it's uh, a bit involved because uh, lots of uh, um, uh, logic needs to be implemented uh, for, to take into consideration for uh, multiple resource uh, factors, uh, not only the resources needed for uh, the Spark driver and the executors themselves, but also uh, overhead memory uh, and uh, upkeep memory, uh, et cetera. And also, this uh, contribution uh, has a, a, a nice um, uh, enhancement to allow uh, Unicorn to be used as the uh, uh, batch scheduler without Unicorn's own admission controller uh, to be uh, enabled. So Unicorn has its own admission webhook. Uh, that's a separate component. Uh, some um, uh, community members have found that to be uh, challenging to deal with. Uh, and uh, now uh, that's no longer needed. You can uh, run Unicorn scheduler itself without its uh, admission controller and uh, have that integrated with uh, Spark Operator while still having Spark applications uh, be able to take advantage of all the uh, capabilities that uh, Apache Unicorn has to offer. And uh, uh, the community is also heavily invested in uh, security. Uh, security uh, is uh, critical for any uh, production or enterprise environments. Uh, there's uh, a mul multiple recent contributions uh, in this area. I won't, uh, I won't go into details for uh, any of these, uh, but. Uh, I uh, just want to highlight that uh, a general idea is that we want to, the community uh, wants to uh, uh, tighten the security posture of the operator as much as possible to make it suitable for enterprise uh, deployments. And 
permissions should only be granted uh, to, to any aspect of the operator uh, when uh, they are absolutely needed for certain functionalities. And there has to be a justification instead of uh, opening up the uh, wide permissions for everything. Uh, and now uh, let's uh, move on to uh, some best practices uh, discussion. Um, so to start, to start off, uh, there's uh, some considerations uh, to deal with the uh, multi-tenancy. And uh, if you are a user of uh, Spark Operator, you might uh, be aware of this uh, flag in the operator helm chart uh, called the spark.jump namespaces. This is a flag that allows a user to configure the list of namespaces that uh, this operator deployment uh, is uh, monitoring. Uh, if you leave that out uh, on field uh, to be empty, then this operator deployment will be uh, by default monitoring all the uh, namespaces uh, and uh, uh, all the applications in the entire cluster. Uh, that may be uh, an acceptable uh, deployment uh, situation, um, but uh, in a, a large uh, busy cluster that has, uh, let's say, uh, over a thousand nodes uh, and with uh, busy tenants, it might not be uh, a good solution. So there's some additional considerations uh, to, be, uh, to be taken into account. And uh, a general recommendation is that uh, you should consider having multiple operator uh, uh, instances in a single cluster uh, in a multi-tenant environment. This is to allow for better tenant uh, isolation because uh, different tenants have uh, different uh, traffic uh, patterns and different uh, tolerance. Um, uh, for example, uh, some tenants might have uh, a, a stronger requirements for application startup latency, and some other tenants may be more lenient uh, in those uh, uh, regards. So uh, by having multiple Spark operator deployments, you can uh, assign different tenants, uh, different teams within the uh, same Kubernetes cluster to be, res to, be, uh, to be managed by different operator instances. For example, you can have operator uh, in deployment number one managing uh, tenants one and two, and the rest of the tenants to be managed by another uh, Spark operator uh, instance. That also gives you uh, flexibility with the resource configurations because uh, some, some busier tenants might justify uh, putting, uh, allocating additional resources to, the, to that operator deployment, managing those uh, busier tenants. Uh, maybe they can uh, use uh, um, more memory or uh, uh, more CPUs. And related to that uh, um, uh, point, there's also a, a concern for performance improvements, uh, especially in a, in a busy cluster. And uh, control runtime provides uh, a feature called rate limiter uh, out of the box, and that's provided and exposed uh, via these uh, two flags in the operator helm chart. And those uh, two uh, parameters are called uh, bucket QPS and the bucket uh, size, uh, respectively. Uh, so what that, what that does is that it provides uh, a way for, uh, to control the inflow and outflow of uh, incoming requests uh, for uh, new applications. So each uh, Spark application CRD object is uh, one single request. A bucket size uh, of 500 is uh, picked uh, as a default. And uh, what that means is that uh, uh, the operator will be able to hold 500 applications in the, in the bucket in the rate limiter uh, simultaneously. And uh, if there's uh, more incoming uh, applications, uh, uh, those will be on hold until the, the bucket is uh, freed up uh, so that uh, uh, they can be admitted and processed. And bucket QPS is another, another parameter that controls the outflow, uh, how, how quickly the operator can uh, uh, simultaneously process uh, those application uh, uh, requests. And uh, these numbers uh, are just provided there as default uh, as a general guidance, but uh, uh, it, uh, it might make sense for your own deployments and uh, uh, your traffic characteristics to uh, experiment with the, uh, these numbers to arrive at that uh, ideal uh, performance um, uh, requirements that, uh, uh, that you may need. All right, now I'll pass it back to Vara to talk about uh, metrics and uh, yeah. observability. Sure, thanks, Sharon. Right. Um, and I think the, going back to the point, I would like to mention, so if you are already using Spark Operator with the old configurations, and um, the, you might not see this performance improvements, that QPS and bucket size, uh, which is recently added into the Helm chart at the latest versions of 2.0.2. Um, so we, have, we are in the process of running the benchmarks yet. So we're still thinking this might be more performant than the previous one, but we don't have the stats yet. Um, but this, uh, you can adjust according to your workload, or how you are running. Um, uh, like uh, Shannon said, you can have multiple operators and have different settings and until, and find the sweet spot what works for you, right, before you get with that. Right, so I, I think the most important thing is now, when you run Spark applications on Kubernetes, and observability is a big factor, right? So uh, your data teams, and they run the job, and they, they say, hey, I submitted a job, I don't know what happened, 
you know, I, I don't see a way that my job is running or not. So um, the job submission can happen from Airflow or various other job schedulers um, with that. Um, but there are levels of observability. So let's start with Spark Operator observability, right? So Spark Operator itself running within Kubernetes. We really want to see what Spark Operator gives, whether how many Spark applications are running, uh, how many jobs are completed, and what is the latency in terms of processing these jobs. So um, we added this feature to the Helm chart, and as you see, um, the small snippet of the code, uh, it just enabled that, and and Spark Operator um, exposes these metrics to Prometheus. So you can use Grafana to visualize this metrics and look at the latency and other things. And then you can go back and verify if you can adjust your QPS and you can adjust your bucket size. That can meet with the latency, right? So it's all about how quickly your Spark jobs are being processed, and this will help you with the Spark Operator metrics itself. Now, moving on to the... The next topic, which is about uh, Spark driver and executor metrics itself, right? So now these, uh, the data teams who are running the Spark jobs, they really want to see uh, how, how much memory and CPU usage, uh, memory usage, CPU usage, and even JVM usage, and how the shuffle is performing network bandwidth, all sorts of metrics that Apache Spark exposes, uh, that you can expose those metrics to Prometheus with a simple configuration, what you see there. Previously, with Spark Operator, there is a concept called JMX Exporter. There's an additional JAR file that you need to use to export those metrics, and you don't have to do that anymore. So this is a built-in feature within Apache Spark. It's called Prometheus Servlet class. And with that class, it handles those metrics and exposes those driver and executor metrics to Prometheus. And there's a lot of open source dashboards with Grafana. You can visualize those metrics and take a look at how your driver and executor is performing. Um, that gives you that overall visualization of the individual jobs. But then, Spark S3 server, right? Traditionally, all the data engineers are relied on Spark S3 server. Uh, they want to see how their job is performing, whether they can optimize the Spark job itself to make it faster. The one way to do it, looking at a Spark S3 server, it'll, it'll give the entire DAG and how long each stage took. Sometimes some of the stages might take a longer so they can go back and change the code and modify it. So how do they get the Spark S3 server logs? But with the Hadoop and other, you know, the traditionally with Hadoop clusters and you have other ways of getting the Spark S3 server. But with the Kubernetes, you have to run a dedicated Spark history server Helm chart, right? And that Spark S3 server Helm chart needs to point to the data where these metrics are stored. So with these four lines of code, uh, not a code, this configuration, that goes into individual Spark job uh, that basically exposes your Spark history server metrics to a uh, writes to an external storage. Um, this example I'm using S3, but you can write to any storage system that can be any cloud provider, object storage, or even you know uh, uh, the, any other file system. So once these logs are written to that uh, specific storage, and Spark history server will be pointed to that storage so that you can visualize all the jobs that were executed even before, I mean, this will give you an option where even if your cluster goes down, these metrics are available for all your data engineers to look into it. So that's the three levels of the observability that we have. Um, but that's with that, um, we're moving on to, yeah, the final slide, and I think we are in time. Right. So. Um, if you are already using Spark Operator, and what we heard from a lot of the folks are they forked the Spark Operator and started to build their own features and using in their organization. It's just because they've raised the PRs in the past, but their PRs were not merged into the Google Cloud Spark Operator just because of the maintenance issues. But then now it's moved to the Qflow Spark Operator. We have a lot of contributors and maintainers now and they're actively working on it. As you can see, the enhancements and features that we added, I think in April, uh, within a short span of time, we have rewritten the whole Spark operator and continuously adding the new features. And so I would urge everyone who is already using it, bring your changes and raise a PR, raise an issue, and make this better, and join the community. So we also created a uh, new Spark Operator channel under Slack channel, under CNCF. So you can join there and you know, raise your questions or anything that you want to contribute. Um, 
And there's two QR codes. One goes to the Spark operator, another one for Slack channel. So uh, with that, Cheryl, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I just want to say that uh, this is a uh, community-driven effort. And uh, lots of the, uh, actually, l all of the uh, PRs that uh, enhancements features that I presented today were contributed by uh, community uh, members. Many of them have become uh, uh, maintainers uh, since their initial contributions. And any contribution is a contribution. Uh, feel free to start any um, discussions on the, on the Slack channel or contribute to the documentation or um, participate on discussions. Um, so, uh, yeah, we wel welcome new uh, contributors at any time. Uh, look forward to seeing you in the community. Yeah, thank you very much. And if anyone has any questions, please come to the mic. Uh, I think we have four minutes before the session ends. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question. I'm a big supporter of uh, Qflow. Used it in Capital One, used it in Freddie Mac. But the challenge always has been with the PR merges when we submitted to Google. It was a nightmare. It's glad, I'm glad to hear that now it's under the CNCF library, uh, umbrella. Um, there are a lot of enterprise type of challenges, the CVEs that were not uh, easy to resolve. Uh, have we done anything in, in that aspect? Do we um, have some sort of um, cadence on taking care of the security uh, vulnerabilities and stuff like that. Right. Um, I'll reiterate the question. So, so you're talking about specifically the container images and CVs, right? So. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, there are the two aspects here. One is the image, uh, the Spark operator itself runs, um, and the image that the the data teams brings to run the Spark job. Uh, the Spark operator, I think we've um, We've done some optimization since we migrated, um, but still we haven't done any of the CVE checks further. Uh, that is something, it's in the pipeline. We are continuing to improve that um, and reduce that, but it's a, it's a big challenge because of all the dependencies and to reduce that. Uh, what we are trying to do is to add uh, some more barriers and layers of the security to reduce that impact for the Spark operator itself. Um, yeah, that, that's, but within the community, uh, Qflow is providing the, um, um, like the Qflow community itself is providing the governance for the Spark Operator project. Um, but uh, our contributors are working independently to make sure that every single PR is matched. So if there is an open PR, I think we have really active contributors uh, looking to merge those PRs. Add yeah, uh, just to add to the uh, security vulnerability discussion, uh, because uh, Spark operator uses uh, Apache Spark uh, Spark submit uh, command uh, behind the scenes, so many of the vulnerabilities that are pre present in Spark itself will show up in the uh, vulnerability report of the operator. And uh, I would uh, encourage uh, the uh, anyone who's concerned about those uh, vulnerabilities to uh, first look at uh, whether those are really applicable, because. Uh, uh, first of all, not all of them, not all of them are critical uh, uh, severity, and even among the critical ones, uh, not all of them are applicable to uh, any uh, environment or uh, use case, uh, and uh, yeah, it needs to be uh, looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. And yeah. some vulnerabilities are easier to fix. For example, uh, we can up upgrade the, the GoLand version, uh, but some others are uh, harder to fix. Um, but yeah, as I was saying earlier, uh, we welcome uh, contributions. Yeah, I'll take one more question, one minute left. So. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I'm in Spark, uh, infra team from Bloomberg, and we have our own Spark operator deploying our clusters. We are very interested in converging to open source operators and follow the best practice. One of our pinpoint right now for maintaining our platform is multi-tenant resource management and GAN scheduling. Uh, we have observed that if users schedule multi-Spark uh, applications, uh, uh, drivers might eat up all resources and all drivers will keep re requesting executors, but stuck because of uh, limited resources. Uh, you mentioned that your scheduler could do a pre-calculation to reserve uh, resources. Uh, I wanna ask how do you handle the scenarios for uh, Spark applications with uh, executors dynamic allocation mode? 
Yeah, that's a good question. So dynamic allocation, uh, because of the nature of uh, how it's implemented, uh, the, not all the executors are requested upfront at the beginning of the execution, and the uh, number of executors may change uh, throughout the course of uh, execution. Uh, and uh, yeah, in that case, uh, gas scheduling is still possible, but uh, uh, yeah, you might want to uh, do gas scheduling uh, based on, let's say, the initial or minimum uh, executors uh, in the dynamic allocation uh, configuration. Uh, and uh, just go with that. Uh, otherwise, uh, because the number keeps changing, you have to go for uh, one uh, single number to, to start with. Uh, do, you, do you have support for the new Spark Connect feature in your operator? Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, the, it has been uh, brought up by the uh, community uh, in, the, uh, in our, uh, I think, monthly community meeting. Uh, and uh, it's on the roadmap, uh, and uh, I believe uh, someone in the community is uh, looking to that. Uh, yeah, that's a great area for uh, the next major contribution, actually. So uh, you're encouraged to join the uh, community meeting and uh, bring up that topic. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.